Hey there, YouTubers! Hi there, Dr. Sheep here. Welcome back to our chemistry video. Last time I did this gas mask bit, it was maybe the middle of the pandemic for China, not for the rest of the world. Now it's the middle of the pandemic for the rest of the world, specifically the United States. Um, anyways, this is our chemistry video. Today we're talking about the metalloids. And today's just another part in my multi-part series on the periodic table. So first we're going to talk about what a metalloid is, and then we'll talk about each element individually. So the metalloids exist on the table in this kind of diagonal shape here. Acetine is a halogen, right? I already talked about this in the last video, and polonium is going to be in this video, which I talked about in the last video, that every table's different. I feel like I've mentioned that in every video. <coughs> Anyways, because they exist in this diagonal line, they tend to violate one of the trends in the table. That trend is that elements in the same column on the table have similar characteristics. However, like most things in nature, including Newton's laws and thermodynamics, they are rarely cut and dry. As the name suggests, metalloids share characteristics with metals and nonmetals. They are for the most part reflective, like a metal. They, are bar they can barely conduct electricity. This makes them great for semiconductors, meaning they can conduct electricity and be an insulator. More on that with silicon, and if I ever make a series on computers. Unlike most metals, if you hit a metalloid with a hammer, it tends to shatter like a brick. I don't know if this is true, but my high school chemistry teacher said that metals, because the electrons flow through them more easily, the atoms are not bound together as strong, allowing them to be more malleable to an extent. I can understand where she's coming from, but that would make mercury the best uh, electrical conductor, which simply is not true. <clears throat> so the first and lightest metalloid is boron. Boron, if we're talking about the pure stuff, is relatively hard to get. However, borax is quite cheap and very easy to get. The primary ingredient is boron. If you remember from last summer, I tried making slime with this very same box, but failed. Anyway, boron in its pure form has no use. It's simply just too brittle. However, boron can form extremely strong compounds, making them great for cutting steel. In simulations, special boron nitride crystals under specific conditions were harder than diamond, and only under specific definitions of hardness. However, none of these said crystals have ever been made, so diamond, for now, is still, the hard, is still as hard as it gets. Fun fact, boron carbide granules can be used to sabotage uh, car engines. So, unless you like going to prison or being tracked by the CIA, I don't recommend you do that. Ever. <clears throat> Excluding carbon and every other element that makes up the human body, silicon is quite possibly the most important element to humans today. By mass, if you exclude uh, oxygen, silicon is the most common element in the Earth's crust. Silicon is important in concrete. It's not as important as, say, calcium or oxygen, but it's still a major ingredient. Silicon is also the major ingredient in glass. Now, yes, silicon is in silicone, which can be made into fun shapes. Silicon is more important in other applications. Care to take a guess? It should be pretty obvious. Oh, wait. I'll let you guess. I feel like Dora the Explorer. Anyways, every single computer that I'm aware of, its microprocessors are made of silicon. You know, I really feel like my creativity is burning out on what I'm drawing on these whiteboards. But there's only so much you can draw when it comes to uh, the elements, right? 
Now, you can't talk about silicon without talking about transistors and Moore's law. Now, a transistor is basically a switch with no moving parts. How's that work? Excellent question. If you shift your focus to my poorly drawn diagram, you have several parts. This bottom part here is your base. Nothing really happens there. You have your positive terminal and your negative terminal. You have an area for the electrons to flow, an insulating layer, and then another spot for current to be applied. If you apply current here, electrons will flow through the transistor and the switch is in the on position. If no current is applied there, electrons won't flow and the switch is, in, is off. With this, you can make basic logic gates like AND gates, but that's another video for another day. Moore's Law refers to that every year as technology progresses, you should be able to fit twice as many transistors into the same sized area as the year before. This is true up until a few years ago, where it now has become too expensive to keep pushing transitions smaller, or you run into quantum tunneling. This happens because the distance between your positive and negative terminals is too small, and the electrons will just go through the barrier. To learn more, watch my energy series, specifically my video on quantum mechanics. Now, companies say that changing the material to something that isn't silicon could help make the transistors smaller. However, the distances we're starting to talk about would just be a few atoms across. However, changing the material could mean they could be more energy efficient, and the switches could do more switching per second. Silicon is cheap, that's why it's used. But it's not the slowest, thankfully, but it's definitely not the fastest. You know, I really wish at this time I knew um, the Animaniacs song for the countries. Norway and Sweden and Iceland and Finland and Germany now have one piece. And that will become a little more clear once I talk about what element we're talking about. The first transistors were actually made of germanium, not silicon. This is simply because germanium, at the time, could do what silicon could do, but at very uh, low purity, uh, but at a much lower purity standard. Um, uh, that being said, it's only really used in very specific applications in today's modern world, so. That's it, other than it's the only stable element to be made into our country. As I said, indium's not made into our country, so. Yeah, the rest of these, uh, the rest of the elements are gonna kinda be like this. Short, sweet, a little unfortunate. To the right, to the right, to the right, now kick, now kick, now walk it by yourself, walk it by yourself. Moving to the right, you have arsenic. Uh, at one point, arsenic was used in Paris green pigment. This was used in wallpaper in the late 19th century. However, this would be fine, but people at the time liked their houses to be draft free. This caused a lot of moisture to build and caused mold growth. The molds would break down the wallpaper and released arsenic into the air. This would eventually kill the occupants. Arsenic, similar to lead, has a white compound that tastes sweet. Now, no one used lead to kill people, at least not that I'm aware of. But this arsenic compound was a very popular poison. All you or I would have to do is tell somebody it's an artificial sweetener or sugar and it would add it to their food or drink, and it wouldn't take much, and they would die. You can't get this compound anymore, thank God. But you can still get pure arsenic on Amazon. At least it says it's pure. And with a little bit of chemistry knowledge, i.e. nitric acid, you could make some. I'm not saying you should, but you could. Whoa! You know, before I move on, there's a lot of things I say in this show, and the series and the channel in general, that you could do, and can do, but you shouldn't do. Anyways, um, move down, we have antimony, not anti-money, antimony. 
It has no uses in the modern world. Uh, it was combined with tin and lead to make a low melting point alloy that was relatively strong and was used in movable text in the first uh, printing press. Otherwise, it's just like every other metalloid. I don't know why I don't have a sample, but maybe by the time this goes up, I'll get some. That's it. Next element. You know, these last two elements, tellurium or tellurium and polonium, I literally could probably just wing. But I'm not going to. I have a script. Uh, tellurium, or tellurium, if you're exposed to it, will make you smell like rotten eggs for weeks. Uh, that will be kind of difficult considering it's the eighth rarest element in the Earth's crust. Its only major use is in tellurium suboxide on DVDs and Blu-ray discs. That's a very thin layer we're talking about here. And those are dying out anyways. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody talking about being smelling like rotten garlic after using them. Um... After DVDs and Blu-rays die, or are gone, uh, there's really not much of any other uses. So, I am artificially making this episode longer. The last metalloid that we know of is polonium. Yeah, uh, it's named after Poland, so you know, there's that. Uh, it's only used in specific applications in anti-static brushes, and that's because it generates an area of ionized air around the uh, it's well, the atoms. So it's, it's the things it's bonded to, uh, and it's because of its radioactivity. And if you got enough of it in one spot, because it's ionized in the air, it would glow. You really don't want to get a lot of this stuff because it will kill you. So, yeah. Time to end the video. Well, that's all of them. <laughs> that was a little shorter video, but I can. But considering the most interesting element is silicon, uh, what can I say? It basically dwarfed everything else. So see you in two weeks for the non-metals, not the halogens or the uh, noble gases, even though they're non-metals as well. In the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. New videos every other Friday, 2 p.m. Central Time, and good night. Banana and French Guiana, Barbados and Guam. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Subs for trees. Oh, you're still here? I thought I told you to go home. Oh, you want more? I'm flattered. Check out the playlist. If you want exclusive content, check out my Instagram, doctor underscore sheep underscore YouTube. That's all lowercase. If you want to help the earth, subscribe. When I reach 100 subscribers, I'm going to plant 10 trees. If you feel that's too small, then check out my channel tree where I lay out even bigger goals. Finally, stick around for the next 20 seconds to give me that sweet watch time. Bye.